Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over UFC Singapore. Um, my daughter, actually, uh, when she was studying abroad, her junior year uh, in college, she studied the whole semester in Singapore, and we actually were fortunate enough to go visit her there. Uh, quite uh, an amazing city, uh, quite unlike anything you've ever seen before. And this weekend, the start time is quite unlike anything you've ever seen before. From a uh, United States uh, uh, perspective, you have a start time of Saturday a.m. Uh, Saturday 5 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, if you want to watch these fights, you have to adjust accordingly. If you live on the West Coast, that means it's 2 a.m. your time. Uh, God knows what you're going to do. Um, the thing about this card from a DFS perspective, and again, we are going to be doing this from a DFS perspective. We're going to do our betting breakdown maybe a little later, later today. This card is pretty much the exact opposite of, of the last couple of cards. Um, the, the last couple of cards I've mentioned uh, were, I thought were going to be pretty low scoring. And last week it actually was very, very low scoring. If uh, O'Malley did not get that finish in the main event, the winning lineup was going to have a loser. In. Um, I think it was going to be Demond Blackshear was going to have be in the winning lineup, uh, even though he lost the fight. And I did predict that that was the context of, of that slate last week. This week is a war. Okay, There's a lot of high finishing upside fights. There are a lot of just overall just kind of high variant situations. And the other thing that's very unique about this is you have a lot of fighters that we just don't see very often. And what that does is that makes the lines, the prop lines, and as a result, the projections that uh, are derived from those lines, extremely fragile, okay? And, and if you think about it, you know, if you have, you know, 40 fighters that are fighting each other all the time, uh, it becomes a little bit easier to predict. I mean, it's not easy to predict, but a little easier when you are very familiar with these fighters fighting against each other in some degree all the time. But when you throw in these 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 Japan these Japanese fighters and these fighters that we don't see very often, if at all, it just makes the confidence in all of the lines a little more fragile. Now, one thing that is important to note is that the fragility kind of goes both ways. Uh, a lot of people just say, oh, okay, that means you just bet the, the underdogs if, if it's a lot of variance involved. It doesn't really work that way. If somebody is, say, price is a minus 200 favorite, and essentially people are guessing, it's it's just as likely that that fighter could really be a minus 300 favorite as it is likely that he could really just be a picker. Okay, So variance and fragility of projections and fragility of lines go both directions. So when you have these fighters that, you know, you really just don't know that much about and you're trying to figure it out from a DFS perspective, ownership is extremely important here, okay? Uh, if, if you have two guys in fights that, or two fights where one of them involves, I don't know, just fighters you've seen like time and time and time again, right? And it's going to be pretty popular, and then you have another fight, which you have two guys or two girls who are just a total wild variant. You have no idea who they are or whatever it is. And it's going to be low owns. That's the one you should be targeting because, again, you know, the fragility of the projection is at, is, is very high. The, the range of outcomes relative to the projection is probably really high. And if you put in the lack of ownership, uh, it's going to make that extremely strong DFS point. Um, we're going to get to some of that as we go through these. Um, um, but let's just kind of go right from the beginning. And there's one there's one fight which we're going to violate a, a rule that we usually use in DFS, but we're going to we're going to get to that in a second. So let's just get right after it. I mean, first fight of the night, you have Simu Choi versus uh, versus Jarno uh, Aaron's. Let's just start right with the numbers. You know, he's he's a minus one forty favorite. Even with the vig, it's minus one thirty. So let's just first let's check and see if there's any line value here. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit. You know, uh, 
Choi is priced at 8,800. That's a pretty healthy DraftKings price tag for this type of, uh, of line. Um, I think of anything, there might be a little bit of line value in errands, but not much. It's not enough to really tip the scales unless there's other things going for him. When you look at the inside the distance prop, which is, you know, that's the first thing you look at is for an $8,800 fighter, you really want him to have Sing Yu Choi about a, you know, listen, if it was minus 110, it would be like an elite play. But it's about, if you get like plus 130, something like that, I think that's pretty reasonable in the absence of a lot of takedown upside. So let's just take a look at this. Um, Sing Yu Choi inside the distance is plus 140-ish, you know, accounting for big. So I think overall, he's kind of a, a break-even-ish type play. You know, not a great play, not a terrible play. I think on a 13-fight card, it's not something you want to prioritize. Um, uh, unless he's going to be extremely low on, which I don't think is necessarily going to be the case. Um, now, when you look at kind of like the variance that I kind of described here, the thing about Simu Choi is he's actually been around the block. You know, we, we kind of know what's going on with him. You know, we, he's fought Kulabau, he's fought Casares, he's fought Arosa. Like these are guys that, that you could do kind of that MMA math with. And I don't mean to say that MMA math is, is, is the correct way to, to predict things, but I'm just saying that, that with a lot of good comps, the line tends to be a little more efficient than when you don't have good comps. Um, you, you take a look at Jarno Aaron's on the other side, his inside the distance line is plus like 500 and that's extremely poor, you know, for his price. So in the absence of, of extreme takedown upside, this fight tends to be a very low priority situation, bordering on a fade completely, right? And now again, when you compare this to the other fights, you'll see where I'm getting at, you know, because like, Simu Choi on, an other, on another card, on another slate, might be good enough at plus 130 to, you know, at one plus 130 inside the distance, play him at 800. But there's just a lot of high upside spots that we're going to get to. So I do believe that the Simu Choi Aaron's fight is probably going to be a fade. So JJ Aldridge against Na Liang. This is the one where we're going to kind of break our rule here. So you look at the at the the line here. You have JJ Aldridge, it's a plus 500, uh, up to 600, 700 some places. And even with VIG, it's like plus, you know, minus 500. Um, as far as a DraftKings price, in and of itself, that kind of translates to something like 9,800 or something, but you're not going to make her 9,800. Her actual price is 9,400. So with respect to just pure line value, I guess that's, that's okay. But, but remember for 9,400, you don't, you can't do that with just win equity. You have to have a very, very strong inside the distance line or, or actually plus probably some takedown upside. So for Aldridge to be a good play 9,400, she's got to, I would say both have takedown upside and have an inside the distance uh, line of about minus 110. Or, you know, if she has an, a round one uh, inside the distance prop of about maybe minus 160, uh, maybe like plus 150 or plus 200, I think that's good enough. Or uh, maybe an inside the distance line in and of itself of maybe about minus 200. That's what you're going to need for a fighter like this at 9,400. So let's just take a look at it. You have J.J. Aldridge, who has really never finished anybody, but her inside the distance line is really strong. It is minus 145, which is almost something you never see in a woman's fight. So really, in and of itself, it's probably she's probably a decent play. And when you compare her to some of the other fighters around her, she's probably going to be extremely low-owned relative to the other fighters, even with this strong inside the distance line. The other thing about it is she does have some takedown upside as well. She did take down, if I'm not mistaken, Aaron Blanchfield, which is pretty, pretty freaking, pretty impressive. Um, but what makes this fight go is her opponent. So her opponent, Na Liang, is just someone who just comes out with reckless abandon, very exciting, and tries to get that first round uh, finish. Okay. And when she doesn't, uh, our previous, our, our recent experience has shown that she kind of gasses out. So you look at some of her, 
some of her fights here. I mean, everything is round one, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, uh, TKO round one win. Uh, kick, she kicked a down opponent right, round one. She lost to Maria Agapova back in 2018, but round one. Then she lost this by submission round two. Lost by submission round two. Then she punched someone in the back of the head, got DQ'd in round one. Submission arbor in round one. Submission arbor in round one. This is not what women fighters tend to do. And then she came out like a like a bat out of hell against Ariane Canalosi in round one. It was a crazy round. And she completely ran out of gas. I mean, she had to like carry her back to the back to the corner. Okay. And then in the fight after that, she went out like a bat out of hell. It just got finished in a minute and 22 seconds. So whether J.J. Aldridge opts to take a measured approach, as she usually does or not, I don't think it's going to matter because now Yang only knows one thing, and that is just go after this. So this fight does rate to finish. Now, the thing I want to uh, – that I mentioned before about a rule that I'm going to violate here is that with respect to Na Liang, I usually just don't bet fighters that only have 20% chances to win, okay, which is what it is when you're a four to one underdog, you know, 20, basically 20% chance to win. The reason why is because it's not enough to get that win. You also have, were trying to get into the optimal lineup. And that what I always say is that, okay, if 20% of the time she wins, you know, is that, that doesn't mean that the 20% of the time she wins, she's always going to be in the optimal lineup. So it's not that easy. But the thing is, is that with Liang, if she in fact wins because of her style, she is going to be in the winning line. And I'm not saying hundred percent because listen, nothing's a hundred, but she's very likely if she wins is to get a first round uh, finish. Okay. So if she gets a first round finish, in a high-paced fight at 6,700 or whatever, she's going to be the optimal lineup. So I am going to play her, even though she only has a 20% chance to win. Um, so Naliang, definitely, a, you know, high variance, upside GPP play. J.J. Aldridge, just because of her metrics, is a good GPP play as well. Not to mention the fact that she's going to be lower owned than other fighters in her range, which, which gives her good leverage. So, I think that as much as this first fight was was almost a fade, I think the second fight you really kind of have to have. And yes, it could bust. I mean, maybe Dao Liang's worked on her cardio enough that she can last the second round, and maybe Aldridge gets a finish in the second round somehow and only scores 100. Um, but I just think it's very likely, given the pace that this fight can can operate at, that someone someone's getting over 100. Uh, and even if Aldridge wins, if she only gets 100, might not be enough, but at least it puts you in the ball game. And if Liang, she wins, it's certainly enough. All right. Uh, moving on, you have Kinoshita versus Billy Goff. So this is a, a mid-range, uh, mid-range priced fight, and we're gonna look at the first. We'll look at the win odds. You have Kinoshita minus one thirty-five. So with Vegas minus one twenty. So let's see if there's any win equity here. Um, I mean, not really. I mean, Kinoshita is priced pretty efficiently given his win odds. So we're just really going to be relying on the inside the distance line and also the takedown upside and things like that. So for these types of prices, 8,300, 7,900, what you're looking for is for an inside the distance prop of about, I don't know, about plus 200, something like that. I think that's reasonable. And let's just take a look and see what these guys are. So golf inside the distance, accounting for VIG is right about plus 200. Kinoshita inside the distance about plus 140, which is pretty strong. Um, you know, look, you compare Kinoshita at plus 140 inside the distance to uh, Choi, who was, I think, pretty much the same, right? Choi inside the distance is pretty much the same, but you're saving 400 going to Kinoshita. That's what makes Kinoshita just a much stronger play. So I think both of these fighters are certainly in play here. Uh, and again, the way these mid-range fights work, it just, they just kind of open up salary in a very, very reasonable way. So this, along with another, uh, well, there are a couple of other mid-range fights that we're going to talk about that are, that are really worth getting into. But this is certainly one of them. I think both of these fighters certainly are in play. Billy Goff, he does have a high school wrestling background, so it is possible he goes for takedowns. Um, but it's also very possible he just tries to, to you know, to to stand in the pocket and swing at him. So I think in either case, I think that this is a very reasonable fight to target. 
Um, and I don't have any preference uh, one side or the other as far as DFS goes. All right, uh, Kanan Song versus Rolando Bedoya. We have a minus 300 favorite here. So we're expecting to see a price of about 9,200, which is exactly what we're getting. Bedoya 9,200 versus Kanan 7K. So there's no line value. So at 9,200, what we need out of Bedoya is preferably a combination of a minus 110 inside the distance line plus takedown upside. Um, and in the absence of that, we want an extremely strong inside the distance line, preferably a round one uh, inside a round one prop of about plus, you know, maybe plus 200 or so. Because Bedoya does not have takedown upside. Bedoya is a pure striker. So if we're going to play him, we really need a either a finish in the first round or a finish in the second round accompanied by a lot of volume and multiple knockdowns, pretty much, or at least one knockdown. So you, you're operating on a very thin margin here. So let's take a look at the at these odds and see if he's worth it. Um, Bedoya inside the distance is plus 120, which is really just not great for a, a striker at 9,200. Um, and when you look at inside the distance, you have, um, where are we? Bedoya in round one, where is it? I mean, plus 525. I mean, I mean, no thanks. You know, this is, this is not going to be a very, very strong DFS play here. So um, probably not going to play him. I mean, I'll play him in 150, but I don't consider him a, a priority spend. We'll get we're gonna get to better ones in a minute. So Kanan Song, on the other hand, I mean, at 7K, the good thing is you don't need much to to play him. He's got to have an inside the distance line of maybe about plus 325, something like that. But given the fact that he's probably plus 300 to win, you're probably not going to get that. So let's just take a look. The Song inside the distance is plus 350, but big adjust is more like plus 400. So I mean, it's it's a really, really fishy play. I, I would play him in 150 max only, and I wouldn't get to him in 20 max. As a matter of fact, I really doubt I'm going to get to either of these guys in, in 20 max. All right, uh, Mikhail Olazechuk versus uh, Chidi Njikwani. Another mid-range fight which, um, which uh, warrants attention. You know, before we before we leave this Kinoshita fight, for example, I forgot to mention that, you know, this again is a fight where you have a lot of unknowns. You know, we've only seen Kinoshita fight once and he got just beat up by by uh, by Fugit. And we really haven't ever seen Billy Goff fight. So there's a lot of variance in this. So if you can get like this fight at low ownership, um, I think I think that's what you're supposed to do. I think I think the lack of information on this creates a situation where you can play this pretty pretty nicely now as opposed to this fight now i'm not saying this is a bad one but this is let, let's compare enjaquani oj chuck is about to pick him uh oj chuck is minus 115 so maybe he's a little bit of a favorite you look at the at the prices it's pretty well just dead straight on and we're going to look at this fight in a similar way to, to the way we looked at the kinoshita golf fight because there isn't a lot of takedown upside in this one and we're looking for about a plus you know 200 or less for either of these dudes to make them good gpp plays and both of them look pretty good you have always is plus 145 trending to like plus 160 with vig and jaquani plus 150 plus 160 so these these two guys are just absolutely stone equal okay um but the thing is that the difference between this one and the kinoshita fight is I do think there's a little more reliability in this line, okay? Um, and when there's more reliability in it, if these if these fighters w w you know turn out to be the same ownership as these two fighters, I think you want to go with the fight between those two fights that ends up lower owned. And you'll be able to listen. You'll be able to check your check our ownership projections and kind of see you know which one you think is lower owned. But I think it's a really important point on a card like this. Now, listen, all four of these guys that we just mentioned, you know, Njikwani, Oazecha, Kinoshita, Goff, all of them, you know, are good plays, right? But when you're trying to play GPPs and trying to catch that, that, that optimal, 
you really want to be a stickler for ownership. And, and so if there's any difference between these fights, okay, I would probably opt for, I would definitely opt for the lower owned one. And I think in general, I think the Kinoshita golf fight is going to be the lower owned because there's just not as much knowledge on these two guys as there is on Njikwani versus OSH. So in, in summary, I do think this is a very, very, you know, fine fight to target. Uh, it's definitely a priority play, but I think it's going to be one of the higher owned of these mid-range options. All right, moving on, we have Kazama versus Garrett Armfield. So you have Armfield as a minus 160-ish. Um, it's very similar price to uh, Choi. So let's take a look at the price difference. You have Armfield 87 versus 7,500. Very similar. So there's there's no real line value in either of these guys. Now, when it comes to styles, I mean, it's so hard to tell. You know, Armfield has one fight in the USC. UFC. He was, you know, pretty competitive against against um, David Onama on short notice for uh, with very little, you know, uh, on short notice. And then he got finished. He was up a weight class or whatever. And then you have the Kazama. And the last time we saw him was at a fight card like this, where he got he got destroyed in, in 30 seconds. You know, so so what's going on here? You know, the thing is, we really don't have much of an idea of what to do with these guys. I mean, even his other fights, arm fields are just, just this lower level stuff that we just can't really gauge. So this is a fight again where I think the line is pretty fragile. So if if it if the inside the distance lines make sense, and if the um, you know and, and if it's going to be low on, which I think it should be, I think this is a fight that you might want to take a shot on. But let's just take a look and see. Um, let's look at the odds here. The problem is Garfield Armfield with that price tag is going to need like a, inside the distance line of about plus one. I don't know eighty seven hundred. What do we need? What do we say? Plus one thirty something like that. Let's take a look and see what he is. Arm fields inside the distance. A plus one forty. I mean, it, it's it's reasonable. It's reasonable. You know, it's it's not elite. It's just fine. Um, so I will put him in my just fine category. I guess alongside of Choi, with the exception of the fact that that I do think that um, arm field might be lower owned. So I, I make him a play. 20 max maybe definitely 150 but i guess he's not really much of a priority here and on the other side of this you have kazama who we really just have no idea what the hell is going on he's is inside the distance line is plus 230 which is and i guess that's fine for his price um and again i, I don't think people can get out of their heads this 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 first round ko so i i just think he's gonna be low owned i guess so I'm going to make him sort of a priority underdog, I suppose. You know, we, we really don't even know if in addition to this plus 230, he's got a lot of takedown upside because he doesn't have, he really doesn't have that much tape. If you want to know the truth. Um, in any case, um, in any case, I think that he's the preferred side as far as uh, uh, GPPs go. Um, and you're going to probably want decent underdogs anyway. So let's let's include Kazama in our short list of decent underdogs. And we'll make Armfield, you know, we'll, we'll make him again dependent on ownership. If he's like 15% or lower, yeah, maybe take it, maybe maybe try it. But overall, he's probably a like fringe 20 max ish play. All right. Um, moving on, we have the heavyweight fight of Waldo Cortez Acosta versus Lucas Bresky. Um, he's a minus 200 favorite, which is probably makes him about 8,900 or so on a card like this. We'll take a look. Uh, 9,100. I mean, this is not exactly the greatest money line in the world. As a matter of fact, I think that, if anything, Bresky might have a little bit of line value. But when you look at the inside the distance lines here, I mean, this is extremely awful. You, know, you have Cortez inside the distance at plus 160. At 9,100 is really poor. And considering he is also has no takedown upside, 
it's even worse. So I think that he's probably a full fade. And Greski is no better. I mean, his inside the distance line is plus 160, excuse me, plus like 460. And he has no takedown upside as well. So this is, this fight is almost certainly going to be a full fade. Now, yes, it's going to be low owned, but I mean, it's just so unlikely that either of these guys get there that it's probably a full fade. On the other hand, you have this heavyweight fight between Junior Taffa versus Parker Porter. So you have Taffa is minus 140 or so. So we're going to put him, I would imagine, about 8,600 on DraftKings. Let's see what we have him. Yep, exactly that. 8,600 versus 7,600. And for an $8,600 fighter, you need to have an inside the distance line of about plus, you know, one, what do we say? Plus 130, plus 140, something like that. Or takedown upside. And when you look at this, you have Tafa inside the distance, minus 115. I mean, that is elite stuff, you know? So he's an extremely strong play. And on the other side, you have Porter at his price. He's plus 225, which is actually not bad. And you throw in the fact that he has takedown upside. I mean, that's probably his best path to victory here. Um that I think that both of these fighters are extremely strong plays. I and mean, I think this is a, this is, I think this is a, just as much of a priority, if not more so, I think more so than either of the other uh, mid-range fights we talked about. You know, we, we have Kinoshita Goff, then you have Olazechuk and Jaquani, and then you have Tafa Porter. I mean, just if, if there was no, you know, not, nothing to do with ownership, I think that this fight is clearly the best, the best. I worry that this fight is going to be high owned, but again, that's just something to, to, to watch for when you, you know, get your ownership projections a little bit later on in the week. But this certainly looks to be an extremely elite fight to target. And you definitely want to target both sides. Uh, there's a little narrative involved here as well. Well, we'll deal with that. We talk about the, uh, the betting breakdown, but uh, the, the metrics here are extremely strong that you know you really just can't ignore this fight. All right, so you have Talia Santos versus Aaron Blanchfield. You have Blanchfield is a minus 140. So you picture her to be about 8,500, something like that. And that's what we have, 8,500, 7,700. And this fight is, is extremely, this line is extremely tight. You know, like everybody's been watching these girls fight forever. And so there's just no way there's anything wrong with this line. I mean, this has been analyzed to death. Um, and because of that, you know, probably the props that are derived from it are pr pr probably pretty efficient. And as a result of that, the projections are probably pretty efficient as well. Um, I think both fighters are going to be owned. I think they're probably going to be owned uh, in a decently relative to their, their metrics. So there's not a lot of upside in general with this fight. Uh, with respect to, to fades, with respect to leverage or anything like that. However, we still have to look at the internals because if, in fact, one of these fighters or both of them have extremely strong metrics, then, then you still have to play them. But there's no inherent, you know, variance. There's no inherent line value or even prop value in this fight at all. Um, but again, let's let, listen. You have two grapplers here. So things are a little bit fuzzy. Uh, it's not just going to be about the inside the distance line, but let's start with that. You have, you know, Santos inside the distance plus 700. You know, Blanchfield inside the distance plus 250. I mean, neither of those things is going to are is going to be good enough to get either fighter there as far as a good DFS play. The only thing that could get them there is the fact that they both have extraordinary takedown upside. Um, the, the thing is, though, is that when you're dealing with two grapplers like this, you also have two grapplers who are pretty good defensively. You know, like if you're an expert grappler, it's very, I don't say rare, but at, at a high level, you don't have people that are just that can take people down but can't defend takedowns. You know, you have that in the, the lower levels. But I, I just I just have this feeling that this fight busts, you know, and, and whether that means you know, the fight ends up staying on the feet somehow when nobody can get the, all these takedowns or that the takedowns don't really lead to that much. Um, 
I have a feeling this fight bust. I, I don't believe that this is the fight you really want to want to go after. However, there's another way to look at a fight like this, and, and it just, I just can't help but remember this one fight from a couple of months ago, and now I forget what, what it was. It was Ricky Simone, I think, against somebody. And there were two grapplers, and this is the exact analysis that people were, were saying, that you have two grapplers that's going to cancel out, and it's not going to amount to all that much. But the other way of looking at a grappler versus grappler matchup is that if, if that's all either of them can do, if one of them is just a, a little bit better than the other one, that could snowball into a into a huge score. Okay, um, so it is possible that either of these fighters can really smash, but I just don't think, relative to ownership, that's really what you want to do here. I think people are going to play this fight because it's a it's a listen, it's a great fight to watch. It's a great fight to whatever, and but. I think from a DFS perspective, I just have this feeling that the fight just busts. You know, it, it it certainly busts on inside the distance lines, right? And the only way it really gets there is if one fighter really just puts it on them with respect to these to takedowns. And it's not as if this card is a low-scoring card where, you know, a 90-point decision is going to get there. It's not going to work, you know? It's, I really think that all fighters that win are going to score 100. You know, um, and uh, anyway, so listen, great fight. Both fighters have their have their paths to victory. I'm probably going to end up being under on it in DFS though. Okay, Rinia Nakamura versus Fernando Garcia. All right, so we've seen Nakamura once, and we saw him for 30 seconds. He just destroyed Tok uh, Kazama as a minus 400. And every other fight that he he wins, he just destroys people. Now, that's not true. He did have a decision here, um, a unanimous decision, which is kind of interesting to see. But he's essentially a, a world champion wrestler, so he's got that. He's got KOs as well. Um, I mean, this guy just kind of showed out his last time. And they're throwing this American in against him at, at like a plus 700. I mean, it's, it's a rough spot, to say the least. Um, Let's 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 go back to the numbers and see what what he is because you look at his price. He's a ninety. What is he? Ninety six hundred, and that's a healthy price tag. So you just want to make sure that you get what you want there. So at ninety six hundred, you need you need both. You need a high ins. You need a high inside the distance prop of at least minus one ten, plus heavy takedown upside. In, a, in the absence of that, you're going to need a first round KO prop of, I would say, about plus 200. Okay. So let's just see what this dude is actually showing here. So, first of all, inside the distance, minus 315. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, and then when you look at him, let's see, round one, Nakamura, round one, minus 180. I mean, this is just, you just don't, plus the takedown upside. I mean, you just, is just the best play, right? Now, I'm not saying you're going to play in every lineup, but but it's certainly the best play. The only thing is, is that it's the best play that everybody knows about, okay? Um, and he's, I think he's got to be the highest owned fighter on the slate. I mean, isn't he going to be higher owned than, even than, than, um, and what's his name? Then uh then Holloway? I, I would imagine so. We'll talk about Holloway in a, in a few in a few fights, but I mean those metrics are just kind of tough to kind of tough to uh tough to ignore. Um because he's gonna be the highest owned, uh, I, I think we should just at least look at Garcia here on the other side. The problem is again, he's plus six hundred and and he as opposed to somebody like Na Liang, um, you have Garcia's win condition is not necessarily like a first round knockout or first round finish. I'm not saying that Garcia is going to win, but listen, he's going to win some of the time. He's going to win what 15% of the time. What do those 15% look like? I, I, what I really think those fights look like is Nakamura just kind of gassing out and Garcia winning a decision. Um, or maybe Garcia has takedown upside or something like that we don't know about. 
but he he won't against against Nakamura. I, I just that's 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 I think the 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 the, uh, the win condition is that Nakamura just goes freaking nuts for that first round KO and just kind of runs out of gas, and then Garcia just has some experience and just kind of grinds him out and wins a decision. So does that make the optimal? Not all the time. So that's the problem. So I'm not going to play Garcia. Uh, if but I will say this: if I get to him in 150 like a certain percentage, I'm not going to X him out just because of how old Nakamura is going to be. I mean, if he slips on a banana peel, and, and, you know what I mean? And, or, or, he, or he just tears his ACL. I don't want to wish that on anybody, but whatever. But and Garcia does get the win. I mean, uh, it's going to be insane leverage <laughs> against Nakamura. So probably have some of them in 150 max just because, again, of how high Leo Nakamura is going to be. But Nakamura is clearly the best player on the stage. Uh, Giga Jakazi versus Alex Caceres. You have Jakazi is a minus 240. So we're expecting, well, plus big minus 220. What you're expecting to see is pretty much exactly this. Jakazi, 9,000. Caceres, 7,200. So for Jakazi to, you know, to be playing about 9K, again, minus 110 inside the distance or takedown upside. He does not have takedown upside, being a pure striker. So all we're looking at is his inside the distance prop. And I believe it's extremely poor. You have, yeah, Jakazi inside the distance, plus 230. To me, on a card like this, this is a full fade. Caceres inside the distance, plus 700. Pretty much full fade. Um, he does have some takedown upside. But... Again, you know, uh, the reason why I don't think it's good enough is I don't think that that a, a decision with a couple of takedowns is going to be good enough on a card like this. Um, the other thing is because Chikazi, his inside the distance line is poor, and, you know, he's going to be very low owned, which means that Caceres, you're not getting any leverage against him. So I do feel as though this fight is, again, probably going to be a thing. So we do have already like a couple of fade fights. You know, you have Chikazi, Caceres fade. You have, uh, hold your nose, but I think Santos Blanchfield might be a, a fade. Uh, Cortez Acosta Breschi, certainly a fade. Then you have, oh, hold on. What's this? Uh, sorry about that. Um, so I think I was going over the fades or whatever. Anyway, so we're down to the last two fights here. And you have Anthony Smith versus Ryan Spann. And you have Spann as a minus 125. So it's close to a pick but not quite. You expect him to be about maybe by 8,300 or so. And that's, I think, exactly what you have. Yeah, 8,300, 7,900. And again, for these types of mid-range fights, you want to have an inside the distance line of about plus 200 or so on either side. And this is extremely strong from... Uh, an inside the distance line perspective. You look at this, you have uh, Smith inside the distance plus 140 as the underdog and Span inside the distance plus 100. I mean, both of these fighters are extremely strong plays. Um, this is yet another very, very strong uh, mid-range fight to target. Um, so alongside of Smith, let's, let's put these again. Smith and Span, it's a spick and span. Smith and Span, Tafa Porter, well, it's not quite as mid range. Then there's also Alizechuk and Jaquani. And then this, this Kinoshita Goff. So all four of these are really strong. And, and these last two are certainly the strongest, like Span, Smith, Tafa Porter, certainly stronger than those other two. But I, I feel as though oh, I know that these fights are going to be higher on. As a matter of fact, the Span Smith fight, this is going to be extremely high on because not only are the metrics strong, but the confidence level is high. You know what I mean? Like, like we've, we've, we've bet on these fighters. We, we've salaried these fighters many, many times. So everybody's very comfortable with these inside, with this inside the distance prop. They're going to pound at this thing. As opposed to maybe the junior Tafa fight, because we don't exactly know much about him. Maybe it's a, ignored a little more. Um, and the 
the certainly I, the, the Kinoshita Goff one, the, the metrics are worse, but it's going to be much lower owned. So just be careful going too much on the Span Smith fight. But it's certainly alongside of Tafa Porter. These are two extremely strong fights. What I would suggest is from a GPP perspective, if you're going to play guys in these fights, you know, make sure you have other low owned guys. Like if you play one, you know, one guy from Smith, Smith Span, one guy from Tafa Porter, and then you play, say, um, what was his name? Uh, Nakamura. I mean, you're really asking for ownership troubles. You know what I mean? Like if you, even if you play both underdogs here, you know, I mean, this, this, this type of build right here, you can play the other mid range fights and make this lineup and, and you're going to be duped with, with zillions and zillions of lineups. I think, I mean, it's just way too easy to play this. So that's what I would do. I, I would, when you do a lineup build, whether you Saber Sam or other, or other optimizers, make some rules where you don't, you don't get Nakamura with both got with both of these fights between Tafa Porter and Smith Spam. If you are going to play, you know, the lottery type tournaments, if you're going to play three match or whatever, yeah, just make the best plays. And as a matter of fact, not to, not to do a full, full build here, but I mean, like, if you want to just play, like I said, like one of the two guys from there and then just, you know, go to these other, you can just play this, you know what I mean? Like, like, play all these guys in the mid range, you play one of these dudes and then you're just kind of off to the races. I mean, it's very easy to build kind of chalky three max uh, lineups this week. It's not so easy to build these lottery type tournament, lottery type uh, lineups that you need to have not be duped with 25 people. So, or excuse me, 25 people, you can be duped with 50 people in a uh, card like this when you have these types of, of, of mid range fights. All right. Uh, then at the end of the day, we have, uh, Max Holloway versus uh, Korean Zombie, Chan Sung Jung. Um, this guy's a minus 800 favorite. And his price is 9,700. And the way he rates to win, there are two different ways uh, or a combination of two. Number one is that he could, you know, obviously finish inside the distance. And that is, you know, let's take a look at the odds there on that. Finishing inside the distance is, um, let's see, like probably like minus 200 something. Holloway inside the distance is like minus 160. I mean, that's fine, you know. Or even if he doesn't finish inside the distance, he's such a high-volume striker that even in a decision, he can rack up just so many significant strikes that he's going to get over 100 that way. So his, his bust path, let's put it another way, is something like a second or third round finish. You know what I mean? Like if he makes it all the way to a decision and Chung for some reason just, just takes all the punishment, it's going to be like 200 plus significant strikes and, and or maybe more. And that's just going to add up and you're going to get 120 points that way. Um, so it's, it, it is a tough thing if you want to know the truth. Um, and he's going to be very highly owned. Uh, is he going to be as highly on as Nakamura? I don't know. Maybe now that I'm thinking about it. What I think that people might try to do, and you could do it, you know, if you played Holloway and Nakamura together, I mean, you could, you could make this work with those underdogs that we talked about, you know, real, actually pretty easily. Um, so again, that's another construction that you probably want to avoid. You know, to double spend up for those. Um, um, with respect to 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 Korean Zombie, I mean, he's plus six hundred, so he's going to win the fight. What fifteen percent of the time? Uh, does he make the optimal every time that he wins? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, how does he win? Well, he, he, listen, he can certainly get a get a get a knockout somehow. You know. Holloway doesn't ever get knocked out, but whatever, it's possible. The other way he could win, I guess he could go for takedowns. I mean, he's had some takedowns in the past, so maybe he gets to win that way. And you know what? The fight is being fight is is uh, being fought in in Asia. Maybe he's got some some judges upside. You know, I don't know. Um, if this were another card, maybe you play him as an underdog to score okay in a loss. But 
I don't know. Listen, I, I have to say that because Holloway is going to be insanely popular, I will sprinkle him uh, in, in 150 max, but certainly not in 20 max or anything like that. So I think the more I analyze this card, I really feel as though the fight that you're going to want to play is this Aldridge and the Angle fight. Okay. It's been so long since we talked about this one because there have been, frankly, so much, there have been better plays. You know, how, how can you compare Nakamura <clears throat> and, and Holloway to Aldridge, you know, who's never had a finish, you know? But I think that Aldridge is going to be significantly lower on than those two, um, where I think that's where you start. I, I think that you don't play Nakamura and Holloway together. Because then you're then you, then you're going to be playing these 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 kind of like the same kind of group of underdogs as everybody else. I don't think you want to play Nakamura or Holloway with both the Smith fight and the the Porter Tafa fight because I think that's going to be too popular. But I think if you play this Aldridge Yang fight, I think you're I think you're taking a different route. Okay. And again, I didn't run like lineups and all my lineups yet, but I think that that is going to, again, put you on a little bit different path. Um, and uh, that's, that's I guess, my big takeaway, I guess, is that I think that the Aldridge Liang fight is going to be, I don't want to say under owned, but I think you should really, you should, you should respect that fight a little more other than, than you might have otherwise. So again, just to kind of summarize, um, the best plays, these mid-range fights are really, really strong. Smith Span, strong. Uh, Tafa Porter, very strong as well. Then you have Enjaquani Olazacek, which is good enough. You have Kitashito Goff, which is probably maybe a little bit better because of ownership. Uh, that looks good. You got a couple of fade fights here, the Caceres Jukazi fight. You have the, I think, the Santos Blanchfield fight. I would probably just fade that. You want to know the truth. Um and it's dangerous because again, if one fighter just just is that much better uh, and gets a bunch of takedowns, you're going to be you're gonna have a big problem. But hey, you got to take a stand somewhere. Uh, uh, Cortez Acosta fade, arm field just okay. Maybe Tazama decent underdog, um, and then uh, maybe the Singu Choi fight is probably a fade also. So I don't know. That's pretty much all I have. Uh, stay tuned. We're gonna, I'm going to probably do the betting breakdown today because I'm going to be on a plane tomorrow. Um, and I might not have time to get to it. So uh, that'll do it. Good luck. Very, very fun card. A lot of points to be had. And uh, I do think that someone takes down the optimal by him or herself. Uh, good luck, everybody.